<clears throat> Those who try to take up the great mystical battle always at first believe that some of the bullets and arrows flying about them are of greater danger than others. And thus are their efforts so guided. Yet operating under this assumption, as valid as originally seems, for too long will keep one so engrossed in trying to avoid the certain assumed dangers as to never have time to stop and get a good, calm, and calculated look at just what the battlefield and apparent struggle consists of. No matter the fine highways, a man without a car can never go anywhere. But once a man wearies of the highways that be, the car becomes a burden. Mm -hmm. yeah. If, and I say if most emphatically, if the justice of life was not so absolutely, unconditionally, all-encompassing, then, then could men, under circumstances they could specify, discover some legitimate bases for feeling mistreated. Here again, a potential secret acid test. You know that you're not only, you know that you're not conscious in any way significant if you have ever been treated unfairly. <laughs> and noticed it. One man used, used to hate going to sleep at night because of how it lessened whatever hold he currently had on his awareness. But then as he had progressed in his ability to so exercise some control over his consciousness, it became a moot point. You get it, don't you? See, as he became more familiar with what he was attempting to do, he began to recognize that every aspect of his life, not just his time in bed, was stacked against him. So what the hell difference did a few hours with his eyes physically closed make? More regarding the matter of justice. If a man was being starved and the body could think and speak, it could understandably say that it was being treated unfairly. Yet life does so to men mentally and no one says a word. What kind of justice is this? Other than dogs belong in kennels, snakes belong in holes, and the thoughts that fill an ordinary man's mind, he deserves if he forever accepts them as his proper nourishment. There was once a man who believed he was being poisoned, but since all of his food tasted the same, it seemed impossible to determine precisely the toxin's source. Under this most common of circumstances, only a mystic is smart enough to figure out that the thing to do is simply quit eating. <laughs> There was once a man who was born with a chronic affliction, but for many years didn't notice it. Then after he did, he discovered he could curb it by the mere act of observing it, which you'd think would have taken care of the problem. But, alas, no. A characteristic of the affliction was its damn near unnoticeability. A man drowning in piss will be little enthused by the appearance of a canary. <laughs> and while I hate to squat so low, for the benefit of those who continue not to get this, no matter how often I repackage it, here it is, simply put. Due to their unawareness of their circumstances, there are some things the ordinary will never see even should they pop up therein. A man drowning in urine will be little enthused by the appearance of a canary. In a singular fashion does life live dually in man, in him physically through blood and breath, and in him mentally through thought. And in both instances is man, under routine conditions, totally tied to and dependent on this born-to connection. This constitutes the natural collective state of man, both of his body and of his mind. 
and those with interest in such activity as this are merely undertaking an individual struggle there against. Ordinary minds make note of how life naturally provides for all of the needs of the creatures of the air, the land, and the sea, yet fail to see how it does so likewise in man in the area of thoughtful consciousness. Prisoners on life support systems feel seldom desire to escape. Yet in spite of all this, there is something to be considered in favor of not knowing about a certain situation. If the situation, when known about, is going to be upsetting, if not downright intolerable. Ah, sweet intolerant, I mean, ah, sweet ignorance, remains a song whose popularity never wanes. The ordinary talk about the life they live in and never notice that which lives in them. It's not a matter of whether you let certain thoughts upset you, but of whether you give over all of your attention to any of them, and are thus forced to take them seriously, regardless of the fact that none of them warrant it. As they say in the mystical eyesight business, staring equals seriousness, and eventually it leads to insanity. Soon after man's mind was in place, he began to feel himself under attack by nefarious forces. And being unable to identify them, he invented the idea of God, a figure that by his own design was known to be, a force that by his own design was known to be good, to protect him from the evil ones that seemed incomprehensible. The mind giveth, then the mind taketh away. Then it Give us some more, then again take us away. Then comes back and gives some new apparent stuff and then takes that away and on like that. Legend tells of a long ago mystical order which went by the name of Enough's Enough Already. <laughs> A passenger on a mythical train one day stopped the Roman conductor and asked, I notice that some of the travel commentaries made available to us concern the countryside through which we pass and that some others are about the affairs here on the train. Why the distinction? Or is this just my interpretation of it? And the conductor patted him on the shoulder and walked on. Once a certain man said to himself, if, with my same overall degree of awareness, I were a literal warrior rather than a metaphorical one, do you realize that I would be a dead man every day, many times over? The first time he thought this, he reacted with a nervous laugh. Then after taking such notes several more times, it ceased to be at all humorous. In light of this story, I would again like to point out that the body has an intelligence of unrivaled proportions. And furthermore, that man's intelligence has potential intelligence of dimensions undreamed of. Many people who show some interest in activities such as this never ever understand that staring is not something merely to do with physical sight. Fact, only animals can have their homeland insulted. And, th and, thus can one, and this can be another test for you. For if you understand it, you're at least in part not an animal. Son of fact, there are many, many things true for children which are not for adults. Yeah, yeah, I know that you'll say, well, everybody knows that. Well, by God, they don't. <laughs> not in any useful sense, or else they would not still mentally be children. Okay, daughter of fact. Lay off a man already. 
Haven't we done enough damage as it is? Well, as a matter of damn fact, no. But we'll let it go for now. Even more regarding the justice of certain things. Anything you take personally, you'll take seriously. Anything you take seriously, you'll take personally. One man, when ready to have thoughts worthy of preservation, would sit at his typewriter, paper on one side, and drugs on the other, to see which would give out first. <laughs> one man skipped the need for a typewriter and just sat before his thoughts. <laughs> one guy had this new idea. You can be the smartest man in the whole world, and the only thing you'll prove is how dumb everybody else is. More regarding the differences of certain things vis-a-vis -vis deprivations, deprivations of the body and the mind. Whereas starvation is serious, ignorance is not. There was once a boy who went up in a balloon and at first he began to excitedly point at the ground and talk about what he saw down there. Then later he began to look around the sky and speak of what he observed there. The day finally came wherein he began to take note of what was occurring there in the balloon's basket and he thought, well now this will about cover it. I've looked out and down at the world below. I've looked out and up at the conditions which make possible my flight. And now I'm looking at the immediate environment of my own personal participation therein. What else is there? Yes, flight fans, what more indeed is there? A rhetorical question that all but covers it, except for the few smart enough and anxious enough to jump out. A certain planet, no longer heard of, became toxically contaminated by inconclusive mental seriousness. And a viewer wanted to immediately write and ask what was the significance of me adding the modifier inconclusive to the word seriousness, but I stopped him. According to a recent article in the American Dental Association's magazine, a man who had once been actively involved in the great struggle, but who had ultimately drifted therefrom, was asked if the abandoning of his effort bothered him any. And he replied that no, it didn't, not unless he thought about it. But what the story didn't reveal was that as soon as he said this, he was suddenly shocked into the realization, which he had always missed, of how what men think is related to what men think. <laughs> no laughing gas needed here. There was once a well-experienced well warrior who mused. The best thing about becoming blind to thought is that then you can't look back even if you wanted to. <laughs> Myth tells of a certain mystical teacher who, as he lay on his dying bed, was visited by those who had attempted to follow his lead, and one of them bent down close and asked, Are you really dying? And the mystic nodded yes. And the man bent in closer and said, Are you sure? <laughs> and again, the mystic nodded that he was, and the man got right in his ear and whispered, Then I don't know whether to weep and be heartbroken or to shoot you in the head. <laughs> and the mystic whispered back, Me either. <laughs> Another fine tale which you may take any way you like. <laughs> and I immediately cut off the possibility of any viewer inquiry related thereto. Okay, a slightly different slant on the older view of it. Anyone who takes the affairs of man seriously still hasn't got a clue as to what life's about. In the sense, 
as understood by the few. You can't really see if, when you look, you always, in part, see you. After his son asked his father to explain the difference between the literal, the metaphoric, and the symbolic, the elder replied thusly, Ordinary, simple people think literally, and those a bit more complex can think metaphorically. And those beyond the level of mere sophistication are able to think symbolically. And the lad pondered this briefly, then said, But where did the more conscious fit into that? Ah, replied the father, they get back somehow to thinking literally again. Although I know this doesn't make any sense. With which the young lad, due to his lack of experience, was for the moment forced to agree. But, being the son of a mystic, only for a moment. All who embarked from Paris on the great mythical express on their way to Istanbul head out originally in every possible direction but the one which leads to that fabled city. This is due to two things. One being that it cannot be otherwise. The other being that there is no one way there. After one of their increasingly frequent private conversations, one man said to life, Sometimes what you tell me is so explosive that I feel like I could run forever, even take off and fly. Then at other times, what I hear you say strikes me as nails driven through my feet, rendering me temporarily immobile. And life just patted him on the shoulder <laughs> knowingly. What criticism accomplishes is a hobbling of the critic that and a flagging of one's lack of any understanding. A one-eyed man in a 3D world will always take things personally. A one-eyed man, even with two good eyeballs, will always take things personally. One father sheep's advice to his son, if you want to live a healthy physical life, just do what all the other sheep do. But if you want to live an intellectually robust one, even to the point of transcending your bovineness, and the boy interrupted them, let me guess. And upon hearing this story, a man reflected. This scene again reinforces the picture of how tricky it is for the droplets in the stream not only to try and distinguish themselves from the general flow, but the extreme improbability of them even ever having an awareness of where they in fact are. As one old rangy shepherd used to say, in the dark, all wool looks alike to other wool. The error-proof way to tell that you are incurably ill, that is, ordinary, is if you want to get well and in fact believe that such is possible, as opposed to, with the more alert, an ultimate, absolute abandonment of any interest in this area of so-called health, which is just another illusion of thought, brought on by the natural condition of the mind. A certain radiologist was unknowingly doomed in that he could not read his own x-rays. Oh, he could look at them, but could never recognize them as his own. And if this makes too much sense, then the alternative is that he never realized that he and his x-rays were one. The door to everything that man wants to know is thought. Okay, so I left out something. Everything save one thing. Legend says that as soon as man learned to walk, and life crippled him, so as to assure his endless struggle, that as recompense, life put out, just over the next horizon, right out in plain view, a simply marvelous secret for him to stumble over. And yet, well, well, mm, no, no one. 
Some more regarding the connection of certain things. Anything you take seriously, you'll eventually criticize. There was once a baby bird who loved its mother's song for a long time, even by bird standards. Yet it finally wearied of hearing it and flew away to find a new song, which it never did. As with any fable intended for adults, you can find this discouraging or encouraging. Or if you've grown completely off the mental height chart, you might even be able to hear what it is actually talking about. And lastly, health news widely unsolicited. Those fascinated by cripples are themselves so. An expansion of a story I repeated last time, taken from the unrecorded annals of the history of this kind of stuff. The version as given last time was that there was a certain mystical teacher an enlightened person, we assume, who long ago, uh, in a certain part of this world, a certain part of this planet, which, by the way, is now known today as a certain part of this planet. <laughs> so it only took three times. Uh, whose public expressions were in contradistinction in a certain matter, to that which was prevailing at the time. Prevailing at his time, all ideas, the general ideas, concerning the struggle to change one consciousness was based upon a basic belief that one must recluse oneself from life, take up the life of a hermit or to take up residence in a walled mystical school of some sort. But according to his tale, as years went by, his sentiments expressed on this matter. That is, that that was not possible, was not pertinent, was, was not even proper. That his negative reaction there too in his public sentiments, expressed sentiments, seemed to weaken. And that someone who had been following it asked him why... It now sounded as though he was not so adamantly against the idea of one separating oneself physically from life to devote their efforts to this kind of activity. And supposedly the mystic said, well, two possibilities. One is that I have begun to change my mind. The other is that I never meant it literally to start with. Now the Expanded version of the story. The person who asked him then mulled on this for a few minutes. And supposedly then the awakened one said, by the by, not just in the area you just mentioned, but have you ever taken note of the fact that almost all of my expressed ideas about the proper approach to trying to stabilize and discover one's own individual consciousness, that almost everything you've ever heard me say has been contrary to all of the recognized ideas, methods, theories, approaches, disciplines, that it just seems almost as though anything that has already been thought and believed, that I was just automatically against it. And according to the story, the questionnaire, again, fell back into the arms of St. Mulling. <laughs> and I think the way I interpret the description of his facial expression was that he thought something like this, or that he thought generally that he agreed 
that indeed, now that the mystic mentioned it, that indeed, now that he mentioned it, almost anything that everyone else believed about this kind of activity, the mystic seemed to express an opposing view. And the questionnaire mulled and got to a semi-conclusive point in his mulling and thought, hmm, that is true. That's what he has seemed to have done. What does that mean? And supposedly, almost simultaneously, during this period of quiet mulling, the mystic himself, almost at the same moment, to himself thought, hmm, I wonder what this means. I knew that that would <laughs> offer many of you much more than the original story did. Taking small liberties with the language, that is lying, I didn't expect that. <laughs> Consider something to change the subject. For those of you that might be watching this for the first time or two and trying to take it seriously, Changing the subject is just, for me to say changing the subject or carrying along the same line is, I just don't want anybody to get initially more confused than is likely. It has no pertinence to anything I'm about to say. But anyway, I want to change the subject from that. Uh, consider for the sake of what I'm going to point out that the consciousness of man, that, uh, we normally think of as our brain activities, your mental activities, your intellectual processes, your consciousness in general. I want to give you a description for the sake of what we're doing. Just one of several, but this one is not disingenuous. And it is this, that there are two main divisions for the sake of what I'm about to say. Two main groups into which men's, men can be divided as regards their individual, their personal state of consciousness. Uh, the first being of the more simplistic, the more physically survival limit, uh, survival based people on this planet whose sense of consciousness, relatively speaking, is by and large, to a large degree, if we could suck it out of their consciousness and show it up on the screen, and anybody had the interest, oh, everybody would say they had the interest, but after a few minutes, see who was still in the room. <laughs> and we could flash up what was going on inside of a man's consciousness. The more simplistic people, the simple, ordinary people of the world, which still constitute a majority, their consciousness, by and large, is focused on the external world. This is witnessed by such Things as, consider the amount of talk you hear from ordinary people. And me referring to simple ordinary people is by, entails no insult, no criticism whatsoever. I'm just describing a group of people. Their conversation is taken up in large part with gossip. Gossip not being, I'm not trying to repackage some sin. That is, they talk about other people. Again, I'm inferring nothing in a negative manner. It's just when they talk, talk being a reflection of men's consciousness, a large part of ordinary people's conversation is taken up with talk about other people. In other words, talk about the world out there. And for the sake of what I'm going to try and turn your direction to, we'll put it this way, that their consciousness the way in which they use their mind is, by and large, as an observer of that which is external to them. This is no great secret. The more simplistic someone is, the ordinary would normally want to throw in the idea of education, which is not it, which strangles them, trying to look at education as being some linchpin in this. But at any rate, it's known for thousands of years. It has been noted that the simple of the world are little given to reflection. That's normally then taken as being 
some stepping stone to say that we should educate the simple folks more and that they would that they should be more involved with a study of themselves and a meditation on their actions and etc and that therefore they would become less simple and only partially civilized and would join more the minority ranks of the more complex the more sophisticated it's just a fact I guess as always there's no reason that we shouldn't get down and roll up our sleeves and just describe it we all know everyone on this planet that understands anything knows if they can withhold judgment or withhold their beliefs that I'm making judgment that this source that this piece of information contains any judgment it's just a known fact that relatively speaking if you had uh, an educator if you had an attorney if you had a anybody that's in the ranks in the ordinary world of the more educated the more sophisticated we would know that if we brought the subject of what goes on in a man's mind the whole idea of introspection the kinds of things that people just generally at certain moments will give over to an expression of self-reflection that given this kind of more educated person a banker a stockbroker but anybody more sophisticated in the world and then as we Reflected in right next to him, we had a man with a sixth grade education reminding you that education has absolutely nothing to do with it. That's not the cause. But a man with very little education, a physical laborer, a nice carpenter or bricklayer. It is a simple known fact, there's no secret, that if we start bringing up the ideas of self-reflection, the whole idea about thinking about oneself, everyone knows whether the people involved could say much about it or not, everyone knows it's been written about for thousands of years, it's been observed, that the latter, the simple farmer bricklayer, is given over to less introspection than the urbanite, than the sophisticated, educated, more civilized man. This is, and it's, it's always, even when it's been observed, it is always taken as some form of judgment and is always taken as a basis for encouraging the more simple amongst us, or whoever it was making the observation at whatever time, of the more simple that we should educate them and try, because if they would engage in self, more self-reflection, the simple would be less given to uncivil behavior. That again, it's a known fact that it appears to be the lower echelons of society are always disproportionately commit the uncivil acts that they're compared to every attorney or bricklayer or judge or mathematician who commits a felonious crime. There are thousands or perhaps hundreds of thousands of bricklayers, out of work people, carpenters, taxi drivers, people with little education. That's a known fact. The educated, reminding you one more time, I'm just using terms, education has nothing to do with it. But then the educated, the more complex, at just regular city level, relatively speaking, they see, from their view, they see that the simple are little given to introspection. It also comes out, it's a commonly known, I pointed this out before, but I'll do it again, and in fact, extremely frightening, disturbing, unanalyzed, disturbing fact that even today you can find someone a uh, person with very little education, just semi-literate, and he, he or she has committed a string of horrendous crime, just serial murders, that sort of thing. And after much publicity, they'll finally track down the perpetrator, to bring him into court the first time. And the camera show, or if a reporter can get to him, it makes it worse, but the camera even shows. There stands a person, and they read out the charges of, against them. They start enumerating, it gets into five or six gruesome murders, and they, they start describing a little bit, and rapes, and just all sorts of just despicable. And they show the person, and the guy may be smiling, and he looks around to see where the camera is. He shows absolutely no sign, not even a little sign of remorse. This makes great copy. I mean, these slasher movies, and the kind of stuff that I know has always been popular throughout history, and fiction of blood-curdling natures and supernatural tales that stuff is child's play whatever effect agreeable effect that has on the masses of people uh, they're just playing with it 
I assure you, the same kind of people that like these horror movies and vampire movies and that kind of fiction, when they see, if they, the occasions when this does make, such as the TV news coverage, of some man who has just been charged with despicable, worst things than you ever saw in movies, and he shows no sign of remorse, that is so blood curdling that people can scarce stand it. Is witnessed by the fact that very seldom is covered. But when it is, it just almost comes and goes. But all of you have been exposed to it, whether you know it or not, if somebody on, the, on TV that they show. Because as a rule, that is not what happens. But if a man shows no remorse to the ordinary, what that represents is that he has almost no inner life. To them, he is almost devoid of consciousness. I know I'm using terms that would not be the ones they would use. But they could agree to this if I stepped in and say, well, it's part of what's disturbing you so much about not just his crimes, because most ordinary people, the majority of civilized people, were out to expose them if we could get them all together on this planet and me show the films, the actual films. I said, all right, this is a man who's just been arrested. And I list the, the string of just egregious, unthinkable crimes. And they go, okay. You know, they even don't like to hear about it. And I say, well, anyway, Watch this. Here he comes in court and watch him read out the charge and watch the camera covering him. And he shows no sign of remorse. People can barely stand that. But if they saw it, and if they, you know, now sorry, wait a minute. Let me ask you something. Can you, do you realize, do you understand what's upsetting you? I'm saying to all the ordinary, sane, civilized people in the world, the relatively speaking, those are a bit more complex than those that would be his peers, speaking at his level of consciousness. His, his type of consciousness. So I could turn to him and I'd say, do you understand it's not just his crimes are upsetting you? And they might give me a continued hearing, like, well, what? And I'd go, could I suggest that what is upsetting you even more than the bill of fare, the bill of indictment against him, is his apparent lack of any remorse? And I would suggest, momentarily, I could get most people to go, huh, 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 that they would realize that there is something just it's just ungodly in the small g sense. Just there is something I almost cannot mentally, emotionally tolerate. Bad enough that I heard the charges of the crimes that he had committed. But then when they showed him when the camera turned on him, and he looked like he was at a ball game. It was a picnic. I saw him posing for the camera, making sure it was ah! For momentarily, I could get people to go, huh, huh. You know, in other words, non-verbally, they would recognize I'm pointing to something that is occurring in them. Something that is an actual experience that is fresh enough that they could go, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I could hold their attention there for another second. And then I, I could then get them to agree to this. I could say, all right, this kind of person, you understand this, this from you people's view, this type of behavior and this type of person, they are the really potential foundation right of civilization. When you think about civilization crumbling and life going to hell in a Gucci bag. This is the kind of behavior, and that's the kind of person you have in mind. Am I correct? You know, not white collar criminals, not people who commit uh, fraud uh, in brokerage houses, not people who kite checks. That kind of behavior. And they would moment, they go, yeah, 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 that's exactly it. In other words, unrepentant, uncivil behavior. And I, if I could get their attention held at just a couple of seconds more, I could then say, all right. You know what I suggest is lacking? The more I look at people like this, and they all go, well, what? And I go, compared to us, you know, all of us, decent, civilized, compared to us, look at him. It's, you cannot know for sure what's in someone else's mind. But compared to us, surely we're safe to assume he almost has no inner reflective life. Because from their view, that would have to be true because they would think, if that was me, if, if by some means, some way, if I had committed such horrible acts, you know, forget how, but if I had and then was caught and brought to the bar of justice, just brought out in public, they would just point out, I would act nothing like that. In fact, if some way I did something like that, and many times this does happen, someone under the influence of drugs or alcohol like will have a wreck and kill people, some pillar of the local society, the community, and they will say later, they'll look a reporter dead in the eye, they'll look the family 
of those that they killed. They'll look at the court, the judge, anybody. They'll look them dead in the eye and go, it doesn't matter. If the court set me free today, it, it matters not because I will be suffering the rest of my life from the memory that in a weakened moment, I did that act. And as far as ordinary people can be serious and sincere, they are. That in other words, the rest of their life, yeah, but they mean at the time, the rest of their life, they will never be able to get out of their consciousness a continuing awareness, I killed a young mother and three of her children just because I drank too much one night. All right, that's ordinary. And I'm still talking to these ordinary people that's observing my fictitious, well, my, in this case, my fictitious, unrepentant mass murderer. And I say to them, all right, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of person we all fear. I throw me in, all of us decent, civilized people. That's what we fear as being the potential downfall of civilization. And they would go, yeah. And I say, but here's what, may I suggest to you why? Why, that it, why not his acts? It's not his acts as charged that are so terrifying because people have killed before. But it's to look at him and he shows no sign of remorse. And they go, yeah, 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 you're right. And I go, but let me, let me suggest further. What it also represents and what really strikes fear, unanalyzed, unenumerated fear in ordinary, more civilized people, is the fact that his lack of any repentance or remorse is also a reflection compared to us. All of us compared to us. Without being mind readers, it has to be a reflection of his relative lack of an internal life. Or else he could not act that way. That's why I brought up ordinary people killing somebody on the highway when driving while intoxicated. Because to ordinary people, if they in some way were, had committed such acts, were in this man's position, they would just be overcome with remorse, guilt, shame. Their, their consciousness, and they're correct, more or less, would probably be taken over, eaten away for the rest of their life over what they had done. And so I would suggest to these ordinary people, his lack of remorse, what is really frightening also to you, is that it represents, compared to us, the best we can make of it, may I suggest, trying to get them all, may I suggest what it represents is compared to the rest of us, just us ordinary civilized people who do not do such things, what, that, what his lack of remorse represents is almost a lack of consciousness. I know I've said this twice, but I, but I want to make sure you understand. Because to them, to ordinary people, it does represent. That, that they can hardly believe that the man is conscious. They can hardly believe that he has a brain that's operating. Because to them, if he had a brain, if he had anything resembling their thoughts, he could not stand there and smile. He would be, you know, he'd be hiding his head. He'd probably be moaning. He could probably hardly stand up. He would be so overcome with what he had done. The second type of consciousness for the sake, second group, for the sake of what I'm going to try and turn your head toward, would be the more civilized, whose consciousness, by and large, now, of course, none of this is absolutely true. It's not just one or the other. But whose consciousness is by and large, and this gets on a graduate scale, according to the more and more complex, the more and more civilized, I'm talking about just automatically, just at the mechanical level. The further they are up in the front ranks of life's parade, we're not even talking about anything extraordinary yet, but just in the ordinary life of man, the further you go up toward the front of the parade, that is the more civilized they are. And ordinarily it is reflected they seem to be more educated and etc. Which is not the reason, but... The further you go up there, the more is their consciousness devoted to reflection on themselves or thinking about themselves compared to those that we just spoke about, the more simplistic of the world, whose thought processes, whose consciousness, relatively speaking, is given over to the external world. That's why they're nosy. That's why they love gossip. That's, you just listen to it. All right. Now something else. People never think about this directly. And so I'm going to say it. You can never know. No one ever knows what's going on inside of someone else's mind. 
Now, you can say that to people, and they go, well, yeah, you're right. But no one ever thinks that. Men are aware of it. I might suggest to you as that is one of the fascinations men have always had with so-called psychology, even with fiction, with gossip, with news. I could even suggest, uh, many of you who might see it, it's not of any great importance, but people who are interested in the profession of psychiatry, of dealing with those who have, as they call it, mental problems, is not just for the sake of helping other people, but it's to hear them talk about their minds because it is such a curious thing, that they're just nosy. That's not the reason people become psychiatrists, but that is part of the enjoyment. That is part of the enjoyment of people, just friends. Of somebody being upset and a friend sit down, a family member or a friend, and say, well, hey, you know me. Hey, I can tell something's bother you, tell me. And the person goes, I don't bother you. And they go, not tell me. I'm your friend. And it sounds like, well, I won't be your friend. I want to help, and I know you're upset. But that's not all of it. Part of it is people just want to hear it. And I don't mean just for some crude uh, reason of being nosy. Is that people have an awareness that they do not know what's going on in somebody else's mind. It's another reason that people love, as I said, not only gossip, but statistics and polling. Yeah. <laughs> as though it means something. Well, it means more than they already know. People also, they're interested in such as that on this kind of basis that ordinary people do look around and they are struck by the inexplicable behavior of many other people. That is, they look around at other people, and I don't mean just mass murderers, but they just look around at other people, ordinary people's behavior, and they find it uh, inexplicable in that they could, they could never do that, and so they assume all humans, all ordinary humans assume that a person's behavior is in some way, some way, either consciously or unconsciously, they would say, directed by what goes on in their consciousness. <laughs> that's, what, that's what ordinary people assume. Scratch. Ignore the giggle. And so they think that uh, if they had statistics, if they would read even fiction or movies, there are people who uphold the belief. Not that they're wrong, but they're not any more engaged in anything useful as anyone else, but there are people who uphold the pursuit of reading fiction, uh, gossip magazines, going to movies, as being a way to gain some small insight, or that some small entry at least, to the possibility of seeing into another person's mind. Again, people operating under the unanalyzed assumption that something is possible when the slightest bit of intelligence would show that it's not possible on this basis, that they cannot even do it with themselves. <laughs> so, as we used to say, where goest thou to get off? Where goest them getting off thinking, well, I will through statistics or through some kind of pondering or through simply sticking my nose in their business, I will, I, will look, I will look at other people's unusual behavior. That is behavior with which I cannot identify. I cannot understand what would do that, which means that I simply don't have a clear, firm grasp of what is maybe going on in that particular person's kind of mind. And it sounds so witty, insightful, when it is just, I mean, it's not even well set, good bullshit. Because they can't do it with themselves. They don't even try. But if you ask them to try, they just go, oh, my head hurts. Now, I don't know what you're talking about. And so everyone is involved to some degree or will express some interest in what's going on inside of other people. That is very interesting. And in fact, oft times, I'll gain some little insight that tells me a lot. <laughs> Any of you who find that one either too, too obtruse ob or too simplistic, I could refer you back to what you hear almost any given night, if nowhere else on PBS, on a nature show, that someone will say something about how beneficial it can be studying the mating habits of whales, studying the sleeping habits of wolves, studying the inner pack relationship between bull meses, 
Because in learning about the behavior of our fellow creatures, we do not just learn about our fellow creatures, nay, but ultimately more about ourselves. <laughs> I mean, it just, it almost weakens one in one's little emotional and would-be intellectual knees, assuming that you're crippled to start with. But it sounds so witty, which is, I'm not just picking on naturalism, such programs as that, because religion, philosophy has been doing it for thousands of years before the government ever funded PBS, before we had television. But it's the same things that if we study, blah, blah, blah. It's not just the understanding, it's not just the knowledge of blah, blah, blah that we might achieve. Ultimately, such journeys of discovery bring us back to an increased knowledge of ourselves. If it ain't, if it ain't knee bending, by God, it's breathtaking. And of course, silly. There is, so now you have some idea of these two ad hoc divisions into which I have placed men into the more simplistic. Again, there is no way I'm not going to, even I am not going to try and give you some detail of any particular man's mind. But for those of you, even though that I said people, as soon as you say, well, you can never know exactly what somebody else's mind. Any intelligent, ordinary person will go, well, well, sure, everybody knows that. What the hell? Why did you bother even to say that? But that is not the basis upon which they unknowingly operate. Immediately after you've made the point, and they'll go, well, sure, we all know that. Huh. In fact, I was just, and they're off again. At any rate, if you understand, relatively speaking, I am not being disingenuous to say that the consciousness of men can be divided into, or men and the regarding conscience can be divided into two major, yeah, that's major, two major divisions, that one and that one. And by the way, I want you to know I was looking, there are within a millimeter of being equal size. That one group, by and large, relatively speaking, by and large, their consciousness is outer directed. It's not a theory, it's just obvious as hell, and as I said, it's reflected in their speech, it's reflected in their interest in life, but their speech is nothing else. It's a dead giveaway. But you're surrounded by it, and so nobody ever notices it, and ordinary minds are not supposed to analyze it, but it's there. And then this other group, relatively speaking, their consciousness is more turned, by and large, is more given over to themselves. You know, how did I act? How do I look? I don't mean that this one is superior to this one. These are all both on the same level. But their consciousness is not immune to gossip, and it's certainly not, a, uh, not involved at all with the external world. It has to be. But by and large, relative to what I'm describing about the first simple, the more simple people of the world, the more complex, at the same level, with the more complex, their consciousness is given over, by and large, to more thinking about themselves. It's turned over their attention, given more to themselves than the external world. Those are both at the same level. At a different level, a different place in this scenario would be people attempting to affect a change. Somebody involved with the thing. The great mystical quest, all that stuff. The thing. They have to have some operational balance between the two, which you're either born with it or you're not. So we'll bypass that. That they can operate. But then there comes a place almost without fail in which they will begin to devote inordinate amounts of time but now at a different level I'll give them that I'll give anybody that at a slightly different level but they become a unprofitably involved in the second that is of consciousness being turned almost exclusively on themselves there in fact has been I doubt that it's ever been described this way but I will because maybe I'll give you something to consider, there have been, probably unthinkingly, 
schools divided even in the attempted effort in this kind of thing of schools that were given over primarily to the more simple people of life which end up being primarily a kind of guru leader follow imitator basis that they're involved very little with anything requiring reflection thought about themselves meditation on themselves and then and that's reflected in religion also by the way and then a fewer schools that have been devoted to specifically or primarily the turning of one's attention to oneself back to the more specific individual point I was to which I was trying to those involved was, was a thing almost invariably reach a point wherein they are unprofitably involved with the reflection, the meditation on, in the full sense of meditation, of themselves at the expense of the world. Not that one is superior to the other, remember, but they have now taken it almost to a new height. And at first it is not untoward, but then it becomes a new height, a fixed sight. It becomes a new height or a new version, a new intensity of staring. Which the more simple you are at the first, at the ordinary level, the more you can stare and it seems to have no effect. I'm talking about physically stare. And then the less simple that the simple are, as they become a little bit more complex, they have to stare less. You have to stare less to start becoming more conscious in the ordinary sense. That is to become educated, to become a thinker. Not in any special way, but just for your thinking. To begin to take some strong or have some strong participation in your life and not just your body, not just the survival instincts. You have to start thinking somewhat more about yourself. But then it reaches a level, and this has nothing to do with egotism, you understand, to say that people at a different level, people involved with such as this, can almost invariably, or do almost invariably, get too involved with a thinking about themselves. But it can be on the basis that it seems to be justified, or it can be on the basis that it's non-egotistical, it's not some sort of vain thing about oneself, but it's just a continuing too great an awareness of one's own self. And seeing as how coincidentally the tape ran out, I will too.